Back to Matt's Movie Nights, uh, where I recommend movies and talk about them. Last time we had an evil triple feature, and we started it off with one of my favorite movies of all time, Evil Dead 2. Uh, Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 and I are connected at the soul. This is, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Just recently, just recently, I started a Letterboxd account. And on Letterboxd, they let you have four favorite movies on your profile. And I'm like, all right, easy. Uh, Spaceballs, Adaptation, Amelie, those are, the, those are the getting spots right off. And then that fourth slot, I'm like, is it Evil Dead 2 or is it RoboCop? And I went with RoboCop because I think RoboCop is smarter. I think I, th I think there's more going on in RoboCop than Evil Dead 2. But if I had a fifth spot, Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 would be fifth place, my fifth favorite movie. Um, it's my favorite horror movie. Um, it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Like, how can you go wrong with Evil Dead 2? Uh, Evil Dead 2 picks up... Well, okay, there's an introductory part that kind of contradicts the first Evil Dead because they lost the rights to the first Evil Dead, so they couldn't use any footage. So they do a very condensed version of Evil Dead that involves only Ash's girlfriend and none of their other friends. But after that, it picks up exactly where Evil Dead 1 left off, uh, with Ash out in the woods and this evil demonic force coming after him but uh in this film the the doctor who found the necronomicon who who had the original recording that they played that brought all the demons to life uh his daughter is coming out to the cabin to like meet with him or check on him see what's like going on with him in this cabin and when she gets there she she finds ash and, like, all this other nonsense going on, and, and... At first, she doesn't quite trust Ash. She thinks Ash is some crazy person who's, like, broken in and killed her family. But, uh, it, eventually it's like, oh no, no, there's something very, very wrong going on here. M meanwhile, Ash is alone in this cabin. Uh, you know, until they show up, it's just Ash, and he's by himself... And he's, like, losing his mind. And it's it's one of the best sequences, I think, in any horror movie. Just, like, Ash in this cabin with all this wacky, crazy stuff going on. And he's he's just, like, losing his mind. It's It's got a, it's got a real atmosphere that's rare in, in horror movies. There's not a lot of horror movies that I think really capture... Like, the, the feeling of insanity that Evil Dead 2 does. You know? It's like it's like Evil Dead 2, The Shining, and, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Those are the ones that are like, this is what going crazy feels like. Yeah, it's... I just... I love this movie. It's... Because it's a horror comedy, and it's both extremely funny... And extremely scary. Like, like it manages to hit both of those perfectly. It is a funny movie. It is a scary movie. It, and it is hard to do both of those things well. There are a few. There are a few movies that do both well. But usually, usually a film is like good at one, not as good at the other. Right? Like, usually... Either the horror will take precedent over the comedy, or the comedy will take precedent over the horror. And I, I think Evil Dead 2 has a very good balance of those two things. Um, part of it is just Sam Raimi's style. Sam Raimi's got a really good sense of style that works both for comedic moments and for horror moments. 
and there's even like a degree to which the funny scenes and the scary scenes are the same. Like that scene where Ash is going crazy. It's creepy as fuck. But it's also a little silly. It's it's kind of a silly scene. And it's it's sort of this weird horror movie that's like what if you were trapped in a cartoon, right? What if you you ended up in like the Looney Tunes and Bugs Bunny was tormenting you? That's what Evil Dead 2 is like. I love this movie. I love this movie so much. Um my last boyfriend I say that as if I've had a lot of boyfriends. My, my, the singular boyfriend I have had to date, and thus by extension my last boyfriend, uh, was not really into movies, but he, he, uh, he asked me once, he's like, hey, do you have a comfort film? And it's not something I had ever thought of before, but the second he said it, I'm like, Evil Dead 2. It's Evil Dead 2. That's my comfort film. I will never have a bad time watching Evil Dead 2. I could watch Evil Dead 2 the rest of my life and enjoy it just as much. It's... It's, it's amazing. It's... Uh, I, like I said, it's my favorite horror movie. It is my favorite horror movie. <laughs> I, I cannot recommend this highly enough. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I positively love Evil Dead 2. What else do you even say? It's, I, I mean, <laughs> both this and Evil Dead 1, you put them on and you're like, oh, so this is the movie every other director's been trying to make for the past 30 years. This, obviously, obviously the Evil Dead movies were like, hugely influential on other directors. Um, like, I love Edgar Wright, man. Edgar Wright's one of my favorite working directors, and I'm like, his style has taken so goddamn much from the Evil Dead. I have heard people try to say, like, oh yeah, Evil Dead 2, it was kind of a remake of the first Evil Dead. No the fuck it's not. It's, it's not even close to the first Evil Dead. It is very much a sequel to the Evil Dead. Um, the first, like, ten minutes are a sort of weird remake of the original Evil Dead because, like I said, they lost the rights to it, so they kind of retold the first Evil Dead in a way that the movie didn't happen. But if you just ignore that part, this is a sequel. This is very much a sequel I don't know why people think this is, like, a, a remake of the original. It's nothing like the original. <laughs> also, the, the, the cover here looks a lot more like Army of Darkness. Right? This is, like, it's, it's Ash with the chainsaw hand holding up the gun. Like, it's a bit, it's a bit more Army of Darkness than Evil Dead 2. But... I suppose, I suppose that is somewhat accurate to the film. Uh, another weird thing is I've, I've heard a lot of people refer to it as Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn, but I have never seen it called that in any official context. Like, like, it's, it says it on the shirt I'm wearing right here. Dead by Dawn. I think maybe that was a tagline? way back when, but uh, every release I have ever seen of this movie calls it Evil Dead 2. No subtitle. So I don't I don't know where Dead by Dawn came from. Yeah, man. I just love Evil Dead 2. It's a great movie. It's incredibly well made. It's funny. It's scary. It's... It's... Bloody as all hell. It's... It's everything I want. It's everything I want in a movie. Uh, I love it. I love it to bits. After that, we watched Evils of the Night, a Vinegar Syndrome release, and a very odd one at that. I don't know, like... 
I don't even remember why I got this. I think I was just drawn in by the cover and the name Evils of the Night. I'm like, this looks like pure fucking nonsense. And I was right, it is pure fucking nonsense. Uh, I want to show this closer to the camera. Um, you can kind of, the girl's nipples are kind of poking through, but like you can't see them. They are covered up. Everyone be cool. This is not a violation of YouTube's TOS. But you can see on the cover there, and this is this is the original theatrical poster. That's the fucking Millennium Falcon, okay? That's not just some spaceship that they slapped on the cover. That's the goddamn Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. They just put the Millennium Falcon on the cover. That's not even what the spaceship in the... I guess... I guess the spaceship in the movie kind of looks like that a little bit, but but that's the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> like, I know that ship. I've seen Star Wars. You expect me to not know that that's from Star Wars? <laughs> like, I'm kind of surprised this is an American movie. It is an American movie, by the way. Um, because, like, like, that's something you would do... That, that's something, like, Italy or Turkey would do in the 80s. They'd just, like, take a picture from Star Wars and slap it on their poster. They're like, yep, the, the Millennium Falcon's in this movie. Yep, it's called Star Wars 2. <laughs> this, is, this is an American movie that just stole artwork from Star Wars. The, the third and a half movie we've watched starring David Carradine... Um, you, you may remember, uh, five years, five, five films, five years from Vinegar Syndrome, we watched Vampire Hookers. That was, like, the second or third episode, I think. We watched Vampire Hookers, and that has David Carradine, and then we watched The Howling with David Carradine, and also I showed Lucifer's Women, which has an alternate cut Featuring David Carradine, but I'm sorry, John Carradine, starring John Carradine, but um, the the version we watched does not have J John Carradine in it. I keep saying David; it's not David. We have yet to watch a David Carradine movie. Um, I'm not above it, but John Carradine just keeps showing up. So, um, apart from. Actors playing the same... I, I think he's the actor we've seen playing the most different roles so far. Right. Because uh, we watched, like, the Dead or Alive trilogy, and that has the same actors in all three, and we, we watched... Um, we watched another trilogy. What other trilogy did we watch? Oh, the Rob Zombie trilogy. And that has all the same actors in it, but... Uh, John Carradine is the only one who has played three different roles in three different movies we've shown. Um, so, so, John, John Carradine, just a regular fixture of movie nights, I guess. And, and it's also clearly one of those, like, late career John Carradine movies where they get him in for, like, a couple days of filming, and he's only ever on the same set. Um, Evils of the Night is about, uh, some aliens who are running a fake hospital where they're, like, sucking, I think, blood? I guess they're taking blood from humans? They're taking some sort of life-saving chemical from humans, like, like, some part of human anatomy gives them life. Um, and there, there's even a very nice, very extended sequence where, uh, John Carradine just fucking exposition dumps. And it's the most, like, blatant exposition dumps ever. He's just like, well, you two are going to be running your own operation soon, so let me explain exactly what we're doing here. <laughs> Like, he's, he says it in exactly those terms. He He's just like, oh, let me explain exact... 
Let, let me explain everything that's going on. Like, it's, it, it almost feels tongue-in-cheek. It almost feels like a wink to the camera, like, hey, we're about to do an exposition dump. Wink, wink. <laughs> um, there, there's John Carradine and uh, these two lesbian aliens uh, who work at this fake hospital draining people's blood. And then there's uh, two old guys who are humans who are, are living in town and they run this mechanic shop and they've been, like, knocking people out and sending them on to the alien hospital. Um, I think both of the mechanics are, like, like old school actors. Like, like they were in a bunch of old movies. Like they, they were really popular way back in the day, but I can't say offhand what they were in. It does feature adult film star Amber Lynn, who longtime viewers of the channel might remember from Things. Also, I forgot to say this, but the, uh, the lesbian aliens are uh, Julie Newmar, the original Catwoman, and Ginger from Gilligan's Island. So, uh, t two, you know, like 60s TV stars. And, and then it's, it's like a summer beach movie, apart from that. Like, there's a bunch of kids who've come out to, like, the beach. It looks like it's just a lake. Like, they're hanging out at a lake and not the beach, but they act like they're at the beach. <laughs> so they're, they're at the lake. Uh, but, you know, it's a bunch of girls in bikinis running around and guys running around like, Hey, how's it going, baby? Check out all the chicks in bikinis. Woohoo! You know, good old beach party movie. Except for uh, John Carradine and his lesbian aliens who are trying to kill them. Not trying to kill them, actually. They get very upset when they die. Trying to suck the blood out of them before they die. Yeah, it's it's a weird one. There's a lot of really weird stuff. Near the end, <laughs> there's an especially funny part where, like... like the aliens are like, oh, we, we can't continue this mission for whatever reason. So they load up into their spaceship and start, like, flying off. But then uh, one of the the old guys, the, one of the old mechanics, is about to kill one of the main characters. And the aliens just fucking shoot a laser out of their ship that kills him. And those spaceship shots seem... Really disconnected from anything else. I would not be surprised to learn that the spaceship shots in this movie were filmed for something else and just inserted into this movie. <laughs> like, the, the lead couple in the movie are named Ron and Nancy, which is the least subtle fucking thing. <laughs> like, like... Now, in the year 2021, I'm like, Ron and Nancy, wow, that's a reference to the Reagans. This came out in the 80s, when Reagan was still president. <laughs> they just, they fucking named the main characters after the president and his wife, okay? That's not subtle. Everyone knows what you're referencing. <laughs> Presumably, this was sort of a knock on the Reagans, because... Like, Nancy Reagan was super concerned about, like, violent horror movies. She, she really hated slashers. She really hated, like, Friday the 13th and all that. She was trashing all these violent horror movies. And this is a particularly violent horror movie. So I, I think it was kind of a, a knock on, like, haha, the Reagans hate violent horror movies. So... We're going to name the main characters of our violent horror movie, Ron and Nancy. Not subtle. Not subtle at all. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> this whole fucking movie is not subtle. This whole fucking movie is, is as blunt as you could possibly be. <laughs> yeah, no, Evils of the Night. It's a weird one. It's pretty fun. Um, not the most fun. It's... It'd probably be, like, a good filler movie for a bad movie night. Like, I, I don't think you could make this, like, a main attraction for your bad movie night, but it'd make a fun filler movie. 
You know, it's it's silly, it's fun, I enjoyed it. And finally, we watched Evil Come, Evil Go, one of the films in uh, Vinegar Syndrome's Five Films for Five Years, Volume 4. Um, but also, like, you can find this movie pretty easily online for free. Evil Come, Evil Go, my god. I was worried about this one going, and I was worried this was not going to be very good, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Uh, I really liked this movie. Um, evil Come, Evil Go, it's this uh, early 70s sexploitation film, which is a, a, a genre I have spent... A, a genre I have really recently gotten into. Like, I, I've watched a lot of late 60s, early 70s sexploitation films recently, and a lot of them are not fun to watch because it's just, like, sex scene after sex scene after sex scene after sex scene, and you're like, have a plot! Do something! Do something other than the sex! Like, because <laughs> I get it, like... Up until the 60s, you could not do sex films like this. This this was against the law. This this was repressed until the late 60s. And the second they're like, alright, fine, you can make sex movies. Suddenly there's just all these movies that are just all sex. Like, 100% sex. No plot. End-to-end -end sex scenes. And let's be clear. Not good sex scenes. Not titillating sex scenes, right? Like, people nowadays are all like, oh, porn is so unrealistic. Of course porn is unrealistic. It has to look good on camera. Sex does not look good on camera. You watch these movies from the 60s and 70s, it's like, yeah, that's what sex looks like, and it's gross. It does not photograph well. So that was my mini rant on 60s and 70s sexploitation. There are, there are some gems. There are some gems in that subgenre. But a lot of them are movies that are just end-to-end -end sex scenes. And it's really boring and not interesting at all. Evil Come, Evil Go. One of the exceptions to, to the rule there. Um... Did not realize the title was a sex pun. Um, it's obviously, like, it's a good title. That's a good title. Evil Come, Evil Go, a play on Easy Come, Easy Go. But then you watch the movie and you're like, Oh, Evil Come. Ha <laughs> ha. Got him. And then Evil Go, because they get murdered. Um, evil Come, Evil Go is the story of a woman who is, like, this super hardline Christian woman who who just hates sex and hates immorality. Um, very, very uh, uh, island of death. Um, I'm sure there's a more popular example of that, but it reminded me of island of death in that way. Like, this this... Hardcore Christian woman who just hates sex, so she, like, seduces men, brings them home, and then murders them. Uh, because they wanted to have sex. And sex is naughty. And she... she ends up converting this other woman to... to... help in... in spreading God's mission of murdering all men who have sex. And rid the world of sexual pleasure. That she specifically says that. She wants to rid the world of sexual pleasure. Which seems like a really weird goal, but okay. <laughs> like, like, it's weird that you would acknowledge that sex is pleasurable. And that the pleasure is specifically the thing you want to get rid of. She converts this other woman and then she's talking about, like taking this religion mainstream and and then she she and the woman murder like a couple other men and then there's like a couple at a picnic having sex and 
the two women, like, see him having sex with this other woman, and they take him back with them to their house, implying that they're gonna murder him. And then the movie just ends. There's no... It just stops. <laughs> there's, there's no escalating plot. There's no climax. Sex joke. Haha. <laughs> Very funny. There's no climax. But like, I mean it. I mean, there's no structure to this movie. It's just... It's like... Sex scene. Murder scene. Long talking about how you want to murder people who have sex. Sex scene, murder scene, more talking. Sex scene, murder scene, more talking. Ah. Uh, and it's... It's very funny. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> cause when, when she first gets this convert, she's like, all right, I'm going to induct you into my church. You're going to be my very first disciple, a, a process which entails tying this other woman to the bed and stripping her completely naked. And at this point in the film, I'm like, is this a metaphor for repressed lesbianism? And then the very next scene, the very next scene, they're sitting together on the couch and, and the main character is just like, so what do you think about having sex with women? And the other woman's like, I'm not going to lie, I'm a lesbian, but I'll break up with my girlfriend to follow your cause. And I'm like, okay, there, it's not even a secret. This is just, I'm not reading too deep into this. This is just openly about repre repressed lesbianism. That's just, that's the plot. It's, it's a movie about repressed lesbianism, and they're not even hiding it. Uh, w w would make, would make an interesting double feature with, um, Witch Who Came From The Sea. Witch Who Came From The Sea is the movie this made me think of, because it's got that weird, surrealist sort of psychosexual, but also, like, kind of feminist undertones. Like, Witch Who Came From The Sea. Like, like this would make a good B-movie with Witch Who Came From The Sea. And I mean B-movie in the classic sense of, like, Witch Who Came From The Sea is the headliner and this is the follow-up film that's not as good. I don't mean B-movie as in, like, cheesy, silly, not very good movie which is what it's kind of come to be known as. I'm sure when Witch Who Came From The Sea played, it was the B-movie for a lot of pictures, but... Witch Who Came From The Sea, good A-movie, and then this is like an interesting B-movie because it's not nearly as good as Witch Who Came From The Sea, but it does cover a lot of the same ground, so... If you, if you were into Witch Who Came From The Sea, uh, maybe check out Evil Come, Evil Go. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but it's also, it's, it's this weird combination of factors that's like, this is a movie I enjoy, this is a movie I think is funny, no one else is gonna like this. This is not for anyone but me. <laughs> this is, this is too weird for mainstream audiences. This is a Matt-only film. <laughs> so... So, you know, if you're into, like, the really fucking weird stuff I recommend, like, the way out there stuff, yeah, check out Evil Come, Evil Go. I, I had a lot of laughs watching this movie. I really enjoyed it. But <laughs> I'm sure there are, like, if you watch this movie and then you're like, this is boring, this is nonsense, this is like, too weird, and maybe even a little gross for me, I completely understand. I understand why you feel that way. I am not going to argue that this is in any way, like, a good movie or a hidden gem, you know. Witch Who Came From The Sea? Hidden gem. Evil Come, Evil Go? No, it's just a silly thing Matt enjoyed, okay? If you don't, you don't have to like this. You don't have to like this movie. It's, it's, I understand. It is a movie I enjoyed, but I don't think other people will. Uh, last time I asked a bit of an odd question. 
I asked what word you think has shown up in the most film titles you've seen. Um, and I, I didn't get a lot of answers for this. Um, I think, A, because it was a weird question, I kind of get that. And B, because no one watched the last episode. For reasons I cannot explain, the last episode did worse than even most episodes of Matt's Movie Nights. I don't understand YouTube. Like, y you put videos out and it's like, oh, this type of video consistently gets this type of views, right? And then all of a sudden, one of them just won't get those views. And you won't know why. But it works the other way, too. Sometimes you'll put out a video, and it'll get way more views than usual, and you're like, why this one? Why was this one the one everyone wanted to see? I don't know. I don't know what makes YouTube tick. You know, sometimes I can be like, oh, this one's gonna be more popular than the others. But other times it's just, like, completely fucking random. Which ones do well, and which ones don't. Anyways, to answer my own question, I think dead would probably be my number one because uh, of, like, you know, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, uh, uh, Dead Poets Society, Dead Ringers, Dead Zone. A lot of movies with the word dead in the title. Although, because, because Superman, Batman are both one word and Spider-Man is a hyphenated word, but if you counted those as the word man... I think man might take the lead, because on top of, what, five Superman movies? Hold on. Superman, Superman 2, Superman 3, I haven't seen the fourth one. Superman Returns, Man of Steel, Batman, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, Batman Begins, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man Homecoming... Spider-Man, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and then just all the other man movies I've seen, like, Man Who Knew Too Much, M Man, uh, Man Who, shit, Man Who Wasn't There, uh, Man With Two Brains, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, Man might actually take the lead if we're going to count mush together superhero names. But, you know, Dead, Blood, uh, Evil, and Night are all very, very common words in titles of movies. Oh, and Black. Black is interesting because there's a lot of horror movies with Black in the title, like Black Christmas and Black Swan, but then there's also a lot of black exploitation movies with Black in the title, like Black Superman and Black Dynamite. So, so, so Black ends up in the titles of, you know, several different types of movies. Whereas, like, Dead mostly ends up in the titles of horror movies, with exceptions. I said Dead Poets Society, that's, that has Dead in the title. Um, or Night. Night appears in a lot of horror movie titles, but, you know, there's other night movies out there. Um, uh, I don't know. It was a weird question. Gregory House commented. He said a lot of the same words I did, although he added, uh, dark and hell. So, yeah, that's probably a good, uh, like, like, I don't know about dark. I don't, I don't know that I could name that many movies I've seen with dark in the title, but hell, yeah, you know, Hellraiser, uh, Hellboy, Hell Comes to Frogtown, uh, Hell of the Living Dead. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Hell movies. Um, but more importantly, uh, he puts in his comment that there are not deserts in Italy, and that, uh, the, the spaghetti westerns were filmed in Spain. So, I, I looked this up, and... Yeah, there are sandier parts of Italy that a lot of, like, the sets were built on, right? Like, if you see Clint Eastwood going into, like, a bar, that was probably in Italy. But those sprawling desert shots in all those movies, that was all filmed in Spain. My bad. <laughs> I, 
You know, it's like I said last time, you know, I'm an American. Don't take my word for it. Take the Italian's word for it. If an Italian says something about Italy, they're probably right. Don't trust me. Don't take my word over the people who actually live there. Do your own research. Like, these, these Matt Presents videos, I film completely without a script. You know, like, if, if I were doing a scripted thing, I would do my research and make sure what I was saying was actually true. But this is not scripted. I am improvising this. I am prone to saying things that are not true. So, apologies to the nation of Italy. <laughs> um, he also mentioned some of the cities uh, Giallo were filmed in. I do know a little more about Giallo than I do, like, spaghetti westerns and stuff. Um, and I kind of love how many Giallo are set in America when they clearly were not filmed here. Uh, one of my favorite examples, a film I just recently rewatched, um, because it was on Joe Bob Briggs, House, House by the Cemetery, I rewatched, and it's set in New York, and there's all these big exterior shots of New York City, and then they cut to the family, and it's like, that is not New York City. I know what New York City looks like, that's not New York City. So, tonight my question for you this is probably going to be an easier one. What's a movie you feel like you should have seen by now that you just haven't? Because um, tonight we're going to look at a movie I feel like I should have watched before now, and I've just never gotten around to it. Tonight we're going back to the old Universal Monster Well, although one of these is not actually a Universal movie. <laughs> But we're starting with the original Todd Browning Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi. Um, following that, we're watching another Todd Browning film starring Bela Lugosi, Mark of the Vampire. And to end us off, a film I really feel like I should have seen before now, but I just haven't. I've never gotten around to it. The original 1925 Phantom of the Opera, a silent movie, the first silent movie we've watched. So, um, showing all the three of those tonight, and we'll be back in two weeks to talk about them. Until then, have a nice day.